Hey all and welcome. I'm on a holiday, but I've pre-produced some videos. This is the first of them, and it should be a little more fun. Formula 1 is still the most viewed category in real life racing, bar none, pretty much. But in sim racing, Formula 1 is not quite as present. Probably because there's only one official game and nobody else really is able to get a license to put a variety of Formula 1 cars um, of the latest year into their sim. Of course, they are kind of mod cars or whatever. But uh, yeah, due to the game being arcade, there isn't really Formula 1 in sim racing. So today we are going to go a bit through the years of Formula 1 in sim racing. And there's kind of no better alternative than taking it to Automobilista 2, where we do not have to rely on mod cars, which is for me always something that I find rather important to have OG content of the games and not rely on mods, which have a drastic yeah, kind of variety in quality. So we are only going to stick to original content of the game. We're starting with a 1967 Formula One car where they were from the numbers, maybe not quite as extreme as today, but they were of course quite challenging and deadly. Not so much an issue in sim racing. So the specs are 400 horsepower, around about 300 newton meters of torque, just under 600 kilos, and with a pretty brutal weight bias towards the rear of 60 to 40. So these cars are pretty much where the Porsches sit these days. Just that they don't have any aerodynamics on board and are pretty damn raw. We're going to go through the years, so we're gonna drive a lot of classes that Automobilista 2 has to offer. And I think we just go and also we're going to take it to one of the most classic, most difficult tracks, which is of course, Monaco. New camera is also on board. I made my phone transfer the video signal via Wi-Fi directly to OBS, so quite a neat feature. So at least for uh, a few sections of the video, you'll be able to see my beautiful feet. And maybe if Luke Whitehead sees this, well, he get issues, okay? Let's, let's just say it that way. Anyway, about the driving of the 1967 Formula One car here, you can see it's quite slow. And you will also see that there's a lot of work to be done on the steering wheel. Very careful on the brakes. You can also see I don't have a lot of brake travel. So you have to look really closely to judge how hard I'm braking. Um, in the other clips, we'll also hear the, have the virtual pedal overlay in the bottom right corner again to make it easier. But also you will be able to see that under braking in this car, we still always have to give the little throttle kick to sync the gearbox and the engine RPM. And especially for the first gear, you have to be quite aggressive because otherwise the uh, rear axle is going to lock during the downshift and then you're gonna slide and lose control and the car is just generally not really willing to, yeah, get back the grip if there ever is something like grip. You can see the car is always floating one way or another. There's not really a grip peak. And that's of course down to the tires of the time still having profile, having really large tire walls. Everything was really soft tires, suspension. The chassis didn't really have rigidity and you can really feel that when you drive along here. Going for a push lap here now braking point despite not really going that fast on the straight is easily in front of the 100 meter board so maybe 120 meters or so and you also locks easily we can't brake aggressively and then the car almost always goes into like an automatic light either understeer or oversteer but it's very tricky to get the car to rotate in a well smooth way around or over all four tires there's always an understeer or an oversteer to fight you basically never have the car just quite in the in the zone but still it's quite enjoyable to drive still because you as a driver matter so much and have so much influence here and this i think one of the few formula one cars that's not actually going flat here through the tunnel we'll see later that i think it takes until later in the 70s when the corner of the tunnel becomes less of a problem. 
Good stuff though for these old cars is that they are quite high, a lot of ground clearance, no aerodynamics that could break on the car. Which means we can be quite aggressive over the curbs if we manage to steer the car there. And of course they are much more narrow than, than today's cars. And then we've already done a lap here. Important to mention because it's not showing here, it will in all the other clips later. I managed a 138 in this car and we'll see how this lap time progresses throughout the years. The next car in line is just two years later, the 1969, I believe, Brabham BT 60 something. The major change is now that the cars start running downforce with, well, just kind of stolen wings from an airplane turned around and not so much sophistication as we know today. That's a bit more power as well, but really the main change is around the aerodynamics. So let's see what actually changes on track now that there's a bit of wing pushing the car down into the ground. We'll do the voiceover one more time. This time sticking to the speed limit here, at least when I'm crossing the line and then getting away through the shortcut of turn one. Now, very important in these cars, the brake temperature already matters a lot. And even if the car is only 600 kilos, uh, during practice I noticed quickly that I was out braking myself here and later uh, in the first hairpin when I didn't have the brakes warmed up. So I started dragging the brakes a little up the hill to get some temperature in the brakes so they were at least somewhat functional when approaching these corners here. Definitely when you come here with cold brakes, this is just not going to work and the lockup is much more likely because then suddenly you get scared, you hit the brake harder and then, well, you're gonna lock up and go straight. We still run pretty much the same car underneath except for the wings, so the tires are largely the same if not unchanged at all and here in the tunnel you can see the fast corner already getting a lot faster giving a first idea of what the wings actually change on the car additionally just for me while driving i felt that the brake points moved ever so lightly forward could just hit the brakes a tiny bit later push a little deeper into the turn without losing the rear because now there was a rear wing pushing the rear end into the ground and keeping it in place and that immediately gave you quite a bit more confidence. I think Monaco doesn't really do it justice because we have so many slow corners where the wing hardly does anything. It just kind of makes the center of gravity higher. So if anything, it might be worse in the, in the very slow corners. But overall, you could already get a glimpse of what the downforce would do to the cars in the years to come. Uh, when they first mounted the, well, still kind of small wings here. But braking, more confident, more reliable. The car, not driving snappy, but definitely not driving as sluggish as it used to before. And allowing the driver really to start pushing a tiny bit, especially in the faster turns. And now the cars really started to yeah, build a bigger gap to the sports cars and also the, yeah, just the road going cars back of the days where aerodynamics until today don't really play a role in terms of downforce for passenger cars from normal ones. So this is really the time when the Formula One starts to build ever bigger gaps to the road cars they were once well originating from one way or another. Lap time wise, the impact of the wings here on Monaco is not really that big. I think it was a second that I went faster than the older version of the car. But I think once we would take it to a little bit of a faster track and back in the days, they had a lot of tracks with long, wide corners. You didn't really have these shite canes and, and tight bands, except on Monaco, really. But even here, I think everything was much wide, wider. So I think on other tracks, we would see bigger lap time improvements just because a couple of wings were added. For the next car, we're jumping a few years into the late 70s. And that brings up the Brabham that famously was called the fan car because, well, it had a fan 
at the back of the car because this was the area where they all started to play a lot more with downforce and especially the ground effect and that fan was supposed to help make that ground effect much stronger by pretty much sucking air for, away from the ground making air move faster under the car and creating more downforce however that car only raced once it won the race but in qualifying it wasn't even the fastest before then it was outruled for the rest of the season lotus however already had a car in the making including pan as well then stopped these efforts after this was forbidden but lotus uh, went on to actually win the season so i think this is the more suitable car before a year later or a generation later we'll figure out the exact year all this uh, ground effect stuff was forbidden and engineers had to get more creative from cockpit view nothing really changed we still have the analog dodges we maybe have a shift light on board now but more than the aerodynamics and the ground effect not too much on the car has changed yes a bit more power but also we have slicks now which plays a huge role in how the lap times were improving at the time but these cars were still super raw and this is also how they drive the slower you are and you see this on monaco a lot of course in the very tight corners behavior wise they haven't really changed much to their 10 year older counterparts that we were just driving before but once you get to the fast corners you could really start telling the difference between these ground effect cars and the previous generation now the corner here in the tunnel is not posing the tiniest of challenges for the car we easily have room on the outside and didn't have to worry for a split second there that we wouldn't make the corner so the downforce effects really start to kick in in these years and i think the engineers at the time were just kind of getting a glimpse of what could be possible when they started to really understand aerodynamics and we're still 50 years later understanding more and more details of the aerodynamics directing air ever more precise around the car into places where you want them away from places where you don't want them and back then everything was still rather basic and the only thing they could really leverage was getting the car in a controllable way along the floor of the car producing the downforce that they had but of course also producing the downforce with the floor posed the risk of well once you had major shifts in your right height levels due to jumps bumps or whatever you could quite easily lose the ground effect because sealing the ground is quite a challenge to this day and it is very risky once you suddenly lose a ton literally a ton of downforce then the cars would just go straight so everything back then was rather rather risky and with the engines getting faster punching through the drag that the downforce car is now produced things were truly getting dangerous and you just get a glimpse here we'll see even more of that um, with the even faster cars that are yet to come but here you had a sense of what it meant to drive these cars around. I was already exhausted just doing a few runs here. I couldn't imagine physically driving the real thing for an entire Grand Prix of 305 kilometers. It's just completely bonkers how much you have to do as a driver here. Not pressing buttons, but just focusing on the car, controlling the car, driving the car. And you can see we are shoving off just... 10 seconds of the previous generation of ours just by adding slicks by adding the ground effect a tiny bit more power but we weren't really going much faster on the straight this is really all in the fast corners where the time is gained and that of course made everything more risky because one something failed in the fast corners the impact speed of the car with any wall would just be much higher than a decade before Driving-wise, you still 
in the slow corners he was still sliding the car around didn't drive much different than the 1967 or 72 car there still sliding a bit still pushing a bit over the front axle still rather unbalanced sometimes you get the understeer sometimes the oversteer but it was all down to the driver to decide and dictate what the car should do what the car was about to do so it was really still the era where the driver and the risk the driver was willing to take the stamina the driver had the endurance capabilities and precision and just raw talent made a ton of a difference to the lap times you could squeeze out of the car We are moving on to the year 1983, where a couple regulation changes uh, forced the cars to get rid of the ground effect because they were getting seriously fast and it was all becoming quite dangerous. And then we now have a McLaren as an option here in Automobilista 2, but after researching a tiny bit, this car actually was pretty unsuccessful because once everything got striped of the, of the ground effect, now Peem started to get or needed to get more creative to produce lap time. However, with McLaren relying on third-party engine providers, they were stuck with way too little power. Here in the game, this car just produces a tiny bit over 500 horsepower, which for the season they were trying to compete in was just not enough at all they were yeah some were ending in the midfield at best so they were uncompetitive and therefore this is not interesting for us however that was a car that eventually ended up winning the championship and it was again a brabham bd52 this car had the famous bmw engine and now you see the link that produced a qualifying up to 1,500, 1,400 horsepower, and that is pretty much 900 horsepower more than the McLaren was able to produce. Though it was quite tight still for the championship because back in the days, reliability was simply the biggest issue for all Formula One teams, and I think this car finished. Uh, I'd have to check the numbers. Maybe half a Grand Prix it was participating in, so there were major challenges. Um, even though in the end the car got the title so of course we'll now have to drive that it looks quite interesting shape wise uh with the with the side pods really far back it looks more like a, yeah a bit more like a fighter jet even with the, with the wings spreading out towards the rear of the car but none of this should matter for us we don't have the ground effects available anymore now so all the downforce has to come from the wings again also we already had that for the lotus 79 we drove earlier the cars moved on to slicks which improved lap times quite a bit so let's see where this stacks up Not sure I've mentioned it, but this car in qualifying trim is producing up to 1,400 horsepower running the BMW engine. In race trim, they were still doing something like 1,000 horsepower, which is still 500 horsepower more than the McLaren competing in the same year and season. And now you can really start to see what I mentioned earlier, that these cars were so overpowered for what they could handle, for the tires, for the aerodynamics they're producing. They were pretty much an engine with wheels attached. There was just such a stark or drastic contrast between the powers the cars were able to produce and the power the cars were able to convert actually onto the track it was just a massive mismatch between the power output and the, the safety at the time and what all other components of the car were actually able to put onto the ground and this is really how how driving this Feels and it really shows you in all situations here I'm, I'm barely on top of the car it's only searching every second you're driving it to throw something at you and to make you crash it is really 
challenging. I'm not sure if I'd be able to drive this with just a G27, G29, because they simply do not respond fast enough to when the rear is just randomly stepping out at 220 on the straight. When you're shifting gear and the turbocharger finally kicks in with I don't know how many bars that were running, but it must have been massive because the engine like today was just one and a half liters and everything was just coming with compressed air from the turbocharger and a ton of fuel thrown into the chambers. Some of these cars, according to Automobilist, they had more than 200 liters of fuel on board, which explains kind of what happened in these massive fireball crashes we had back in the days when a driver lost control, which really seemed very easy with these machines here. I was going to say that the tunnel corner is flat, but the car has so much power that it's going to kick the tail out at 260 from just raw power. A true challenge to, to drive this. You were always overwhelmed as a driver, always fighting the car rather than driving in, in it with a yes. It's kind of as a unit. And even, even less than with the previous cars, I could imagine actually driving this in real life, let alone a Grand Prix in a competitive scenario. In front of us, we have the McLaren MP4-6, I believe, which is a championship winning car of 1991 with Ayrton Center at the wheel. As you can see, the cars we had previously in the late um, 80s with the uh, turbochargers and more than a thousand horsepower, which were really hard to control and again, were getting really dangerous. Again, rules changed and now the cars were down to something like 750 horsepower. This again then is driven by a three and a half liter V12 and downforce again, we're just gradually improving one of the last cars that is driven with a manual gearbox in fact the last car with a manual gearbox to win a championship which was going to change for the years to come so i think we should give it a go I think this is the time when it must have been that the cars were more feeling as a unit with the engine being and the power being more suitable to the downforce the cars had to the capacity the tires could provide and while yes of course it's a formula one car and you will be able to overstep the limit and spin or slide and drift and all sorts of stuff the whole package of a car now just feels much better yeah set up to the different elements to match one another right so you had downforce on board that was fitting with the power you had you had grip in the tires that was able to convert the power and put it into the ground the car somewhat was less intimidating because the the engine or the the torque explosion wasn't as brutal but of course you can see we're still going pretty fast and uh, the down first was still massively improving the cars are super fast through the corners and they're also really light and nimble and small and they were going fast through the small corners as well where a lot of the lap time is going to come from but also you can start to tell that all the other parts on the car, the suspension, the dampers and the brakes, everything was just getting quite a bit better and the speed and everything really, not just incrementally improved, but it feels like your bigger step in these cars here. The corners are just much faster. You can wrestle the car around much more. It will take more of what the driver asked of it and you are much less likely to slide around and actually lose grip. You can push much more aggressive now and request more corner speed at the end of the day. And also with the engines being 
naturally aspirated again, you had much more throttle control and it was way easier to start working the car as a driver again after leaving the aggressive turbochargers behind where yeah half of the rpm range really didn't do anything but then in the second half everything just exploded and here power is available much more linear the cars are very snappy still very responsive but they are never unpredictable there's very good communication here between the car and the driver and that eventually allows us to bring the lap times down quite a bit it was 126 before in the cars before and now we're already hitting 120s Nineteen ninety-three, and again we are looking at uh, McLaren. This time, the Flash Eight. Very special because this is part of the Formula High Tech Generation Two, an automobilista two, which features a rather unique um, set of cars. They were special because they had the first time. Well, not the first time that started the year before, but it was all kind of um, perfected in the nineteen ninety-three season. So they all had active suspension, ABS, traction control, launch control. They could alter the attitude of the car on the straight, so something like DRS. And this is what this class features before all these features were forbidden for the seasons afterwards. So I think we also need to drive that one. We are again around the 700 horsepower mark, so it's not the engine that is special in these cars. It's all the technology outside of the engine and the shift towards aerodynamics and electronics is kind of at its peak in this generation of cars. Just testing the, well, not the DRS system, but the active suspension that is also cockpit operated where i can just kind of raise the nose drop the nose and when you raise the nose it's directing the air differently to the rear wing and reduces the drag of the car giving you more tap speed so this is kind of the original drs that we have in formula one these days where they changed the rear wing and you can also see they had a nice launch control on board where the driver would just go to neutral press the launch control button the car then holds the rpm at a fixed level and controls to slip as you let go of the button you're just flooring it and there's also automatic upshifting in these cars just always shifting at the optimal point so you as a driver didn't even have to worry about that part anymore you would only take care of the downshifts to make sure you're not locking the rear axle on the brakes you could also start to be more aggressive with the car because they also had ABS on board. So much less, yeah, kind of issues, much less risk for the driver and you could more confidently start pushing towards the limit. Just raise the nose here a little bit. You can see the DRS active to increase the top speed a little, reaching the braking point at just shy of 270. Of course, the corner in the tunnel is not an issue anymore at all. Overall, the cars, I think, they really feel how the name sounds. They feel really high-tech. They are really sharp and at the same time quite clean. They have a lot of tolerance for what you do as a driver. Of course, the, the TC always prevents you from going too far. But you can also start really working together with the TC and put the car in a position that is more difficult to handle when you wouldn't have traction control on board so you kind of can work at tinier margins of slight angles where the traction control will help you to keep the car there and not overdrive it not underdrive it and perhaps not eat up the tire with all your lighting it's also just a lot of fun now because the faster it becomes here i think the more interesting monaco gets the more your mind is challenged to kind of suck up all the information of the car and how quickly the world flies by but it's really nice that when you have this car underneath you really feel confident and didn't need many laps for me to start pushing and move the brake points further and further 
closer towards the corners and push into the corners as well not having to worry about potential lockups anymore as the abs would tell me that could also be much more aggressive on the throttle again putting the car right away into tiny slides along the walls here the active suspension then is really just that button for the driver to reduce the drag on the straight but it's of course also active during driving just that the driver doesn't have any influence there you would just be in the setup where you change your damping of the active suspension and the responsiveness to things on the track the active suspension would try to mitigate and this helped the cars back then to stay much closer to the desired ride heights and thus they could more be more aggressive with the ride heights with a the setup they didn't need as stiff suspension as the years before to keep the car just within the range of the ground effect now the cars could be a bit softer again offering a bit more mechanical grip because the act of suspension would make sure you always have the right height and ground clearance you need to never suddenly use your or lose your downforce so this was really a very interesting area and if you look at the lap times losing a bit of time here unfortunately but we've dipped well into well, well below the 120s let's let's put it that way so we're starting to get much closer to the lap times that we know today we started with 138 and now just 23 years later we are at 118 so pretty much one second per year 10 years of course there's many cars in between that would be super interesting to drive but they don't really have much in this category which is the what is it actually Formula V10, uh, that era from, I think it was like 1997 to 2004, I believe. I picked this one, the Generation 2, because the Generation 1 does not have the traction control. It's still the, what is it, 2001, 1999 car, whatever. And the Generation 2 is in 2002, and this seems to be modeled by the Williams FW32. So they have the traction control. Um, they have a launch control as well and this is the era where Michael Schumacher really dominated which is also the the prime years where, where I was watching uh, Formula One so I kind of have a connection to that the cars don't really look that fancy compared to these day aerodynamics there are not too many fancy wings there's a big wing in the front big wing in the rear yes the floor is going to produce some downforce but there's not a lot of winglets and doesn't seem like the air is directed around the car in, in so much detail as it is today however these were one of the fastest cars around and they were also quite a bit faster than what was the formula high tech we drove earlier so they were just more extreme but in comparison to the earlier cars they are much easier to drive and i'm almost going to say these are the everyday person formula one cars um but we should get driving so you can have a look among the cars i'm driving in this video this is probably the easiest to drive and i don't know why exactly that is but it must have just been a time where the rule book kind of reined the cars in enough but the technology was so good that they could really get on top of a lot of problems that formula one teams usually face to control the aerodynamics to be really in charge of how the downforce levels change throughout the lap in different driving situations or how the power unfolds of a 900 horsepower engine and really kind of taming this with a traction control for example also you saw there is a launch control to make it easier for the drivers to get a nice getaway and then just the power steering feels quite a bit different here it's not as harsh to drive as the cars 10 years ago where there was huge steering forces the car was dancing all the time and a bit of understeer a bit of oversteer a bit of snappiness all this is now gone in this generation of cars and you as a driver were really just telling the car where to go but there was no problem ever for the car to actually convert any of what the driver was really throwing at the car it always seems like when when driving that 
that actually the limit kind of changed from the car being at the limit to the driver being at the limit because the speeds increased so much now that you as a driver really had to kind of overcome your fears and thoughts and expectations of what is possible and just brake later and brake harder. The cars had so short braking distances. We are probably taking an entire board later now for braking into the corners and on the power we can be much more aggressive and the traction control will still sort us out and we are anyway accelerating faster than any generation of cars before maybe excluding the turbo cars of the 80s and that is just the car is just going to go where you're pointing the wheel and it's never really at capacity it is always down to the driver to be fast enough to notice what the input you are doing is actually doing to the car and more often than not you're steering into the epics too early you're hitting the inside wall because the car just has much more grip than you were expecting and really takes quite a few laps to start going fast enough for the car to actually reach the limits where you're like oh now this is the speed i can carry through this corner and the lap time we're going to see now really shows the improvement just another couple of years when we are going to do a 114 The last car we're going to drive in this video is the modern day F1, in this case the 2022 version or in AM2, the Formula Ultimate Gen 2. Much more sophisticated aerodynamically, um, much heavier by design. They're also much bigger, 1.6 liter turbo engines again making a comeback to Formula 1, 900 something horsepower, maybe 1000 these days. But the main thing about those, of course, are the aerodynamics. And I think there's not much more to say. So we just take it for a drive, see how much it outperforms, if it does the other generation cars. And that should be it. I think there isn't too much we need to explain about modern day Formula 1 cars because they are still the recent generation. So most of you will probably know what they're about. Tons of downforce quite some high weight, 1000 plus horsepower, and a lot of electronic systems on board, even though nothing that is quite a traction control, nothing that is quite ABS. But how often do you really see lockups these days? How often do you see cars spinning because the driver over did it actually on power? So the cars must be, despite their figures, despite the speed they're doing, there must be great drivability. And I think it gets across quite well here in automobilista too you can tell that the turbocharger is really just doing its magic in the background but you don't have any of the feelings you had back in the 80s where the turbocharger was just one big intimidating thing that released all the power at once in the high rpm ranges you very much have linear power supply here throughout the entire throttle pedal and as a driver that really gives you a lot of options you can also be quite blunt because in the lower parts of the throttle it's not going to be too aggressive so you as a driver are less likely to make mistakes i think the hardest part is actually be fast enough when the drs is available to press the button and then the other challenge really is the speed of these cars is insane that you can actually slide the formula one car in third gear in turn one in monaco at 180 or something and it's just going to stick and be controllable even if the rear steps out you still never really feel like it's threatening you it is always still predictable even though everything happens so fast you can still easily correct it and make it work it's pretty much the same as the 2001 car we just drove 2002 car where the main limit here is your mind that just needs to adapt to the insane speeds late breaking points and just getting an experience and trust that the car will actually slow down from 300 to something like 60 in just 70 meters some corners also that were really challenging at the beginning of the video just stop being a challenge at all like the swimming pool she can it's just easily flat out with room to place the car and in the end the lap time really shows we have shaved off another couple seconds doing 112 now
All right, guys, I hope you were able to find some joy in this video of this little journey through six decades of Formula One, where we went from 138s in the pretty bare bone cars of the 60s down to 112 in modern day Formula One cars. I think they're probably doing below 110 these days. So we shaved off pretty much what? 28 seconds of lap times half a second per year in development and there's probably no end in sight we started with the cars in the 60s where there was little available then the engine the tires still wet threaded the suspension was very soft and the drivers were still center of attention then we went through the 70s where the aerodynamics really started to really kick in and kind of overwhelm everything else and then we moved on to the 80s where it was the insane engine power of the turbocharged cars that was really making their impact to a lot of electronics coming in in the 90s and just then yeah pretty much in the light 10s and 20s that that we are now we really start to see the combination of it all where it's all electronics downforce power controllability all coming together so if you enjoyed that leave a like subscribe bye